I'd never run the 100 metres confession there. <laughs> One man shocked himself 191 times. Behaviour change at its fundamental level is identity change. Hello and welcome back to the Waterstones podcast. It's a new year, a new season of the podcast, but some things remain the same. Great authors, great books and great chats around a theme in each episode. To begin 2020, we don't want to fall into the trap of new year, new you, shaming you into gym membership or diet plans or unrealistic life goals. We're taking the theme of changes to allow us to talk to Emily Dean about her frank, funny and inspiring memoir, Everyone Died So I Got a Dog. To Claudia Hammond about the art of rest, in which we discover why rest is as important as sleep. And in the studio, we're joined by one of the most influential doctors in the country. You may have seen him on the BBC, listened to his podcast, Feel Better, Live More, or read one of his books on health and stress relief. His latest book, Feel Better in Five, presents a daily plan that begins with just five minutes of your time, but might just change your life. An idea I can completely get behind. It's great to have Dr. Rongan Chatterjee with us. Welcome, Rongan. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm also here with Holly too. Happy New Year, Holly. Happy New Year. How We've was Christmas? It. it was so great, thank you. It was wonderful. Shall we, shall we confess? It's December. It's December. We're recording this, of course, before New Year, so we don't know what's going to happen at Christmas. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen at New Year. Are we, I mean, do you like Christmas? Are you a Christmas fan? I absolutely love it. Actually, you've said before, haven't you? You love Christmas dinner, basically, don't you? Food, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) How about you, Rongan? I love Christmas, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely love it. I've got two young kids, so I think if you don't like Christmas, which I always have, but... You know, having two young kids will bring Christmas to life for you anyway. How old are your kids now? Uh, nine and... I was going to say six, but my daughter's just turned seven, so nine and seven. Nine and seven. And they are super excited, that's for sure. Because they're very good ages for, for Christmas. They really are. How about New Year? Because New Year does have this kind of pressure leading up to it, either because you're supposed to have, like, the best night out on New Year's Eve, but also this thing about what you're going to achieve in the year to come. And I always find that really, really oppressive. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in answer to your first point, I've got to say, I've been off New Year's Eve for probably over 10 years now. Yeah. Like, yeah, in my 20s, it was great. And, you know, well, I think, you know, in my head, it was great. The reality was, it was always a letdown. Yeah. Frankly, it was, you know, you'd be outside some club somewhere at an ungodly hour, can't get a cab home. <laughs> and you think, why have I done this exactly? Yeah. I think for the last few New Year's, I'm not sure if this is cool or not, I don't think I've stayed up to see the new year in, which really? is... You haven't even made it to midnight. I haven't made it to midnight. The last, <laughs> last two, for sure, I've not made it to midnight. So, uh, and uh, Do you know what? I felt absolutely fantastic on New Year's Day. So. I support that. Do I you? really, really support that, for sure. Yeah, I'm mm. sort of heading that way. I, I do stay up till midnight, but I'm not sort of the party... The party boy in me is, is in bed well before I think I think it's probably a bit of age as well, yeah. I guess. Yeah. You know, an experience. And if you do have kids, I think... You know, you stay up late, then the kids are still going to be up early the next morning. And um, I don't know. I've just gone off. I really like Christmas for me. Yeah. Um, you know, even if I think back to being a, as a, a medical student in Edinburgh, we always had to, not a medical student, as a junior doctor, you had to choose basically the sort of unwritten rule is you either work Christmas or you work New Year. Okay. And you mm-hmm. kind of, within the team, you guys kind of figure it out. For me, it was always about getting Christmas off. Yeah. Uh, and I was very happy working New Year. Uh, so I guess I've always preferred Christmas to New Year. I think I might be with you on that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's think about this This thing about New Year is that it can make people think that they need to make change in their lives and, and, and become healthier, fitter, maybe something like that. And your new book provides people with a, a way of doing that which isn't so oppressive. It doesn't sound like you have to kind of sign up to some kind of horrific military-style campaign to change your body. This idea of being able to do something in five minutes appeals to me greatly, Rongan. So could you please tell me a little bit more? Yeah, okay. So look, um, I have found over and over again with patients over nearly 20 years now that the way to encourage people to make long-term change, so change that they make in the short term, but they feel good about it and they manage to continue it in the long term, mm-hmm. is to make it small and to do it consistently. Now, it sounds obvious, but at this time of year... Everyone wakes up on New Year's Day and thinks, okay, look, right, it's 2020. Right, this year is going to be different. I'm going to do something this January that I've never done before. And this year it's going to work in some sort of miraculous way. I'm going to buy a book that's going to help me suddenly turn my life around. And I understand that. And I've had that sentiment before. So I totally get it. But the problem is, is that 
most books and most plans around our lifestyle revolve, what's that they revolve? They, they rely on the idea that motivation and willpower will continue forever. Mm -hmm. Right, and we know that that's not true. Research shows us this, science shows us this, clinical experience shows us this, they always run out. So in fact, one of the lead uh, behavior change authors in scientists in the world, Professor BJ Fogg, calls it the motivation wave. And you have to plan for the motivation wave. So, you know, we're here on the Waterstones book, uh, podcast, right? You guys are going to have lots of health and well being books out in January. Now, I would say that people could pretty much pick up any one of them. Right, and if they follow it for a couple of weeks, they're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. Right? They'll, if they want to lose weight, they're going to lose weight. If they want to, you know, be at the gym regularly. They're going to do that, and that's fine. But as a doctor, I'm interested in yes, having people feel good this January, but also teaching them skills so that they can feel good in February, March, April, May, and. You know, I'm, I'm conscious I am on the Waterstones podcast because this is why there's a new year, new you market every January, yeah, right? Yeah. This is why health and well-being books are sold in their bucket loads every January. And I guess the industry sort of takes advantage of that in some ways because people are looking for that. And why I think my book is different from pretty much every other health book out there is because, number one, it's based on almost 20 years clinical experience about what really works with people, busy people with busy lives but also the latest behavior change science. And it's really, really clear if you want something, if you want to turn a new behavior into a long-term habit, there's a few things you've got to do. Right, you've got to make it easy. We know that when your motivation is high, like on New Year's Day, right, a behavior can be really hard to do and you'll still do it. Mm -hmm. But when your motivation is low, the only way you'll do a new behavior is if it's easy. Mm -hmm. And that's why in my book, I mean, I deal with health in a 360 degree fashion, so I deal with things that are going to help your mind, so your mental health, things that are going to help move your body, but also things that are going to help nourish your heart, which we can talk about at this time. But um, I give people a selection of five minute workouts, whether it's strength, high intensity, dancing, um, yoga flows, and they all require no equipment. And that's the key. Every time you bring up an obstacle to that behavior, you make it much harder to do. And I'm saying to people, right, your behavior is constantly being changed by the world around you, whether you realize it or not. I have studied those tools. I have used those tools for good, and I put them into my book. So I'm saying let's use the principles of human behavior change and use them to help improve your well-being. And for most people listening to this podcast, I can tell you that joining the gym it's the worst thing they can do this January, right? <laughs> Honestly, and I, I, I never used to say this, but it's become clearer and clearer to me over the past years that it makes you feel you're doing something, right? You talk to gym owners, they'll tell you that business model relies on the fact that most people who sign up for memberships won't turn up. Yeah. If everyone turned up, you won't be able to get in the gym, right? <laughs> I guarantee if people start following this plan five minutes every day. Now, another tip for behavior change is at the same time. Now, why is that important? About 56% of what me or you do in any given day is not conscious thought, it's habit, right? And the only way or the best way to turn a new behavior into a long-term habit is to stick it on to an existing habit. Mm -hmm. So that's something you already do. So for years when I used to have a little bit of a coffee habit, which I'm slowly kind of uh, working my way through at the moment, I would weigh out my beans, put it all in the French press, and I, I'd put the timer on for four minutes, right? During those four minutes, I did a body weight workout in the kitchen. So literally, for probably about three years, I never missed a four minute body weight workout on any day, because I was never not gonna have my coffee, mm -hmm. which meant I was never not gonna have my workout. But if you have to, think, oh, I'll fit in stuff for my health and well-being when I've got time, you know what? Other things are going to get in the way. We, we all know that, right? And so this is why you say, find a time. So I think the kettle going on in the morning is a brilliant time to do what I call a health snack. And there's loads of ones in the morning for your mind. How do you spend five minutes in the morning actually doing something to, you know, calm your mind, to set you up for having a happy and productive day, whether it's journaling, whether it's a five minute breathing practice, whether it's five minutes of flow. One of my patients who has stress related migraines, she's tried meditation, she's tried everything, right? What worked for her? Five minutes of adult coloring in, um, adult coloring in books yeah. every morning as she put her kettle on. So 
the key thing she had to do before she went to bed, she had to make sure there was a journal, sorry, uh, her coloring book, and the crayons had to be by the kettle. Because if you come down and it's not there, it's very easy to do something else. Mm -hmm. So I know I'm getting overly passionate about this, but it's because <laughs> I have seen this work over and over again. And actually behavior change at its fundamental level is identity change. Because if, if you can't do what you've been asked to do, you feel bad about yourself. You feel, oh man, I, I can't stick to plants. You know, how many people are gonna buy one of the books from one of the health and wellbeing authors just January, and by the end of January, they're gonna go, oh, this wasn't the one, you know, I can't stick to it, mm. right? My program, you can absolutely stick to every single person, no matter how busy you are, has got five minutes. And this is how, it, it's, you do five minutes every day at the same time. And that's the key. And I guarantee within days, you won't even be thinking that this is hard work. It will just become a part of your day. So I've realized I've done this without realizing that's what I was doing. I wanted to do something to improve my fitness and I thought I'll do couch to 5K. And finding the time to do that is a little bit tricky, but every Saturday and Sunday, my son has to be taken to football. And I used to be stood in this field in the freezing cold watching him play football. And I suddenly went, now, I could do the running now because mm. I, that would keep me warm, first of all. And it's a time that I wouldn't be doing nothing in otherwise. So now, as part of my routine of taking him to football, I also have the time to do that exercise. And now I do it without thinking. Exactly. Mm. So I didn't realise what I was doing was, as you said, coupling it together. With you couple it together. That's the secret. Honestly, if there's one thing people take away from this is... Whatever, whatever um, health and wellbeing plan you choose to follow this January, right? Because my job is, I'm a doctor. I just want to help people. I don't care which one they go and get. If they want to go and get something else that they feel resonates with them, that is fine. But the little tip I would give them is whatever new habit you're trying to do, right? Couple it with something you already do without thinking. That's the secret to making a new behavior stick in the long term. That's not just because I said so, that's what Professor BJ Fogg, probably the world's leading expert in human behavior, that's what he says as well, right? Okay. I'm not into arguing with Professor, so I'm going to take his word for it. <laughs> I'm feeling inspired and validated by that, Holly. How about you? Absolutely. Are you ready for yeah. some action in January? Oh, for sure. Well, this year, well, 2019, I uh, set myself a New Year's resolution, in inverted commas, of doing one part, at least one park run a month. And once I got into the habit of doing that, I just wanted to continue bettering my time and bettering myself. And therefore I stuck to doing one a month, but would still go out and do a few runs in amongst that to make sure that each month my time was getting better, I was getting faster. Mm. And having that motivation really helped me. Love it. We've heard there a little bit about how you can choose to make change in your life through very simple you know five minutes a day we're going to hear now from an author who's going to talk a little bit about how change can sometimes be forced upon you we're going to hear from radio presenter author and podcaster emily dean her memoir everyone died so i got a dog has potentially the most spoilery title ever and hints at the humor with which she writes about the really devastating period in her life when she lost first of all her sister rachel and then her mother and father all three of them dying in the space of just three years i would love to share our whole chat but that would actually require almost its own podcast series because we've got to talk about lots of things so here is an excerpt in which we spoke about the changes that were forced on her by such a total bereavement i certainly felt with my sister it was it was a huge shock it was um it it threw my whole life off course off balance it forced me to go back to ground zero, essentially, and rebuild myself, mm. I think. And I think hearing that news, there's no... I've learnt this, having done effectively a PhD in death and bereavement, and saying goodbye to people. You know, I'm an expert in goodbyes. I've always thought, when will I master a skill? I never felt I was... I, I excelled at anything, but I'm brilliant at death that's what I do now, is I know how to give people a send-off, how to spend their last moments with them. And back to your original question, I think with my sister, it's very hard to put into words, um, but it was fear, I felt. And years ago, when I was young, my dad, I remember, told me to read the C.S. Lewis book, A Grief Observed. And I never forgot, he said, no one told me grief felt so much like fear. And you know how things stay with you as a kid? Weird quotes. 
And my father's very into literature, so they're always stuck in my head. And it came back to me. And I thought, God, this is frightening. Mm. And that, that fear is so overwhelming. And I think the fear keeps you going. The fear is a kind of adrenaline. So with the initial diagnosis, when I found out my sister, we were told, um, as I describe in my book, but we were told that she had, we initially, I thought she'd have a couple of years to live, you know. I thought she'd have more than that. But then we discovered she had months and then the months turned into weeks because she died three and a half weeks after the diagnosis and she had two small children. So it was horrific. But I remember that period when she was alive, that three-week period, it felt like the preparation... I don't know this uh, because I've never run the 100 metres confession there (laughs) but uh i imagine how it would feel you know in that permanent warm-up state to that that adrenaline pumping through you preparing for an event sort of not wanting it to come in a way Hmm. um that's how it felt adrenaline kept me going that desire to keep her alive that Hmm. desire to preserve things as they were and the crash when somebody goes, Mm. is like nothing I've ever experienced. You know, that's what's so extraordinary about grief, is that it represents change in the most profound sense possible, I think, that it's possible for any human being to have because I feel that grief is something we're all terrified of. Mm. Understandably, you know, we see... It's funny how we fetishise love a lot in our society, don't we? Romantic love. And we ostracise death and grief. And yet, for me now, I think grief and love are so inseparable and so linked because I, I think that happened when I realised that everybody I love will die because a lot of the people I loved have died. And once you understand that grief and love are so linked, I found that helpful because I realised love will always end in grief. Mm-hmm. So you have to come to terms with it. I suppose, as you say, that, that they're linked in that it, it is only the people that you love that you will grieve when they go. Mm. You need to have that love first, don't you? Does, does that mean that you've been able to come to terms in, in a way with the grief because you realise that, that the grief is itself an expression of love and therefore that takes you back to more positive feelings of maybe of remembrance and of... Yeah. Seeing her daughters grow up and... Yeah, I think I think it's difficult. And listen, if I'd have just lost someone, and if anyone is listening to this and has just lost someone, you know, feel free to feel free to throw stones at whatever listening device you're listening to this on and saying, well, yes, it's all very well for you, you know, seven years on. And that is absolutely right because it's time, yeah. isn't it? And we all know that. And I think I how I viewed grief and this sounds really odd but bear with is as my teacher and I always said to myself it's not one of those teachers I always called them Dave and they always said hey I smoke weed let's do the lessons out in the sunshine (laughs) yeah call me Dave yeah or mate because you don't learn anything from Dave yeah whereas Madame Miller Oh, I mean, I had a shiver thinking of her. Never forgotten anything she taught me. So I realised that grief is one of those teachers. It's the very tough, usually maths or French, let's be honest, teacher. But you remember those lessons. Mm. Um, And Dave is the movie with the friend, the sunny day in the park. It's great at the time, but you don't... I don't know how much it, um, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful passing pleasure, but it's, unfortunately, it's the tough things you learn from. Mm. And that's how I saw it. So every time I would have a moment and the pain would be indescribably awful, you know, I'd be sitting there and I'd think, I'd remember, I'd sort of wake up and I'd feel happy because it was sunny or because there was a song I liked on the radio and then I'd remember. And that's what kills you, the mm. remembering. Mm. Uh, and I think this was helpful for those moments. I'd think, right, okay, I have a choice. I can go under 
and at the t- point when I lost my parents and, you know, I, I always call it my the Game of Thrones showrunner was in charge of my life, just killing everyone off every sort of, not just every season, but every seven minutes in the show. It's like, I imagine they'd held a meeting and said, look, come on, someone's going to have to sort this out. We're going to have no cast members left. But you do have that moment of feeling just that sense of being the last one standing. Yeah. It's 28 days later. It's, you know, the apocalypse. It's um, just me then. All those things. And if you're not careful, that can lead you down a path of self-pity, I think. Even though I would have felt entitled, you know, in fairness. <laughs> I think saying to someone, stop feeling sorry for yourself when the whole family's died, you know. Yeah. I was allowed to, but I didn't think that was a, a positive way to live and... I thought that was an insult to my family. But I genuinely think what happens when you lose people. I feel with my sister, I never felt as good as her. My dad said the best has gone when she died and that cut me Mm. inside. And now I feel in many ways she was, she did lead a better life than me. But I I feel now that she's gone all that goodness hasn't disappeared. And I think the legacy it's left in me is it's made me kinder and more compassionate. Because I think when you lose someone, it changes you so fundamentally. And I think something of them gets wrapped up inside you in the changes that you make in your life. That's their legacy, they live on in you. Mm. And so what we didn't discover uh, in that conversation, but I can tell you now, is that um, Emily got herself a lovely dog, a Shih Tzu called Raymond, who very much helped her. And she also did something called the Hoffman Process, which she found really, really helpful. Um, But Rongan, you must have people coming to see you all the time who are dealing with grief. And it's something that can have huge effects on you physically and mentally. Um, And I thought it was really interesting how she was saying that she was able to move on eventually. It took time. But something about that taking that positivity up from her sister and wanting to do justice to her life by slightly changing how she lived her own. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, as a doctor, I've, you know, experienced uh, patients dying, you know, helping people through loved ones dying. But as I was listening to that, it took me back because it's almost seven years since my dad died. Uh, This March will be seven years. And... You know, some of the things that she was saying about, you know, you're, you're almost preparing for a race that you don't want to come. This is, it was, it was amazing because it really took me back and I thought, wow, this is how we were like for years and certainly the final few months before dad died. Um, and I've gone through my own reflective process since my dad died. Um, probably, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit obvious really, but it probably one of the most significant uh, moments in my entire life, you know, to lose a parent and then all the kind of inner thinking that I did after that. And I can very much resonate with that sort of idea that, you know, my dad was an immigrant here. He worked really hard. He worked two jobs. He literally, I think he killed himself working to mm. give his family and me and my brother a, a great start in life and a great upbringing. And I remember in the few months after dad died thinking, dad felt like he had to do that. And I think he has given me a great start in life. Um, For me now, if I do the same thing, if I overwork and I do all the stuff that I don't need to do, then wouldn't that be a tragedy that I don't learn from my dad's life? So, you know, not quite the same thing, but certainly a common theme there where I think that we can use grief, we can use uh, death to... You know, to make us think and reflect how grateful we are that, yeah, we are still here and what can we learn from someone's death. Um, so, yeah, sure, many I can... Uh, I think I'll probably be processing that later today as well because it was quite a, a poignant piece there. It made me think of a friend who lost her sibling earlier this year and she, during that process, while her sister was very poorly, she actually got a horse. And for her, that was the best thing that could have happened yeah. because eventually when her sister did pass away she had this companion that she had to be kind of mucking out and seeing mm. twice a day so actually for her keeping that routine and a bit of normality was mm. the best thing that ever could have happened yeah. really out of such a sad situation you need that thing otherwise if you're just left to just sit there and think and ruminate it's very difficult she, the, another metaphor she used was she said it's a bit like glitter if you've had a sort of glitter bomb go off in your house and you hoover it up grief you think you've kind of got rid of it and then 
every day you mm. find another little bit there'll be something yeah. that will remind you and, and so it will never quite go away what, what I found super helpful that's something I talk to my patients a lot about these days is the importance of um, time but, but the importance of downtime and I think this is particularly an issue these days as we have, you know, we've got these supercomputers in our pockets. And so I know after down dad, I spent a lot of time when I could, I'd just go and walk. Mm. I could just go and walk without a device. And I would just think, and I think, you know, looking back now, I think that really helped me process things. And I think had I walked with a device or sat there just um, numbing my feelings with endless scrolling through social media, I, I think, I imagine that would have... Um, impacted my ability to actually process some of those deep feelings because I think, you know, on a, on another level, I think that is something that many of us are doing on a on, a, on a, in our daily lives. And I, you know, I'm not talking about grief per se, but we're not spending enough time alone with our thoughts because it's never been easier not to. And therefore, a lot of the time, you know, we can tell people to, oh, they're scrolling too much. Let's say on Instagram, for example, but actually. For some people, that's an escape. Some people, that's a way of not dealing with the reality of their life because it gives you a bit of escapism. Mm. Um, And it's something I, as a doctor, this whole piece of connection, I talk about it a lot. Um, In fact, you know, in in this sort of five-minute program that I talk about with patients, I I deal with what I consider three aspects of health. Body, we've spoken about. Mind, Mm. which is things that you can do for your mental health each day. But I also have this section called heart. And this whole piece reminds me of that section because um, I put it at the, the, the end of the book, but I say some of you may be sceptical, right? But this is the most important part of the book. Five minutes each day to nurture your human connections, whether that's connections with your family, connections with your friends, with your partner, uh, connection with yourself. Um, let's give an example. One of the things, because I follow this this plan, this Feel Better and Five plan in my own life. It's how I stay fit and well when I'm super busy like many people, one of the five minute uh, recommendations that you might want to consider in the heart section is something called a tea ritual, right? And it's it sounds so simple, right? But it's about something my wife and, and I do most nights. So, you know, relationships are under strain these days. You know, everyone's busy. Even when we are with the people that we love, whether it's kids or partner or friends, we're often distracted, mm-hmm. right? We're sort of half there, but we're sort of mentally a million miles away on our phone whether it's our emails or it's who just sent me that message on Instagram you know we all know that feeling and I found with patients but also myself five minutes of focused connection time with my wife each day transforms our relationship so we put the kids to bed clean up the kitchen and before we go and do our sort of whatever we want to do whether it's go on our phones or watch something or whatever it is we sit down in the kitchen it's called the tea ritual. Make a cup of tea, mint tea for us, because I'm not very good with caffeine in the evening. And we'll literally sit there in a clean kitchen for five minutes without our devices and talk about each, other, each other's days. Mm-hmm. It sounds so simple, but it, it has transformed the, the fabric of our relationship. We feel closer. We feel more connected with each other. It's so easy these days for people just to be passing ships in the night. And... Again, I've used this with many of my patients. So they've t- a lot of people have told me it saved their marriages. Mm. And, and, you know, this is why I'm really passionate about these little five-minute segments that we can do each day that don't take long. Ideally, five minutes for your mind, five minutes for your body, and five minutes for your heart. I think if people follow that, whether, whether you're sick and really need help with your health, I think this plan will work. If you are trying to prevent getting sick in the future, I think it's the same plan that's going to work for you. And I think if you're someone who's actually generally pretty well, but is sort of sick and tired of always feeling knackered and needing caffeine to get you through each day, I think this same plan will help as well. It's the same, these fundamentals of good health. And I think what people are really going to like is the fact that I have given people 50 options in the book, right? But you just need to choose three, one from each section and do the same through every day. So the reason why you don't want to change it up each day is because that leads to procrastination. If you if you if you think, okay, I'm going to do a five minute workout today. Oh, I'm going to do one of his strength ones, or his. Or maybe I'll do a yoga one, or maybe I'll do a high intensity one. You know, that's indecision. Before you know it, you're like, oh, God, I can't be bothered. I'll do it tomorrow, <laughs> right? So I say initially stick to the same three every day at the same time. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of feel I've really. 
I've got to say it was the hardest of my three books to write this one. Um, but I read the audio book just a few weeks ago. I'd had a couple of months away from the book. And honestly, I was really, really uh, pleased when I read the audio book. You need a bit of time away. Yeah. And I really felt that I have distilled health down into its into the essence of how simple it can be. I'm not sure I could make health any simpler than I have in this book. And mm. I, I really hope it, it helps the amount of people that I think it can help. I think if my, if my wife is listening to this, she will like the idea of the tea ritual, mainly because she likes tea. There you go. I think that could work. I probably, but genuinely, right? No word of a lie. I challenge you to try it. Oh, I, I don't need to. I'm, I'm, that try it to five days a week. Yeah. Try it for a week, just for the next five days, and just see what happens. Because okay. people who do it tell me things in their relationship change without them even realize it. Like a, a couple are more affectionate with each other. They're mm. just a bit more caring. It's this, we are starved of connection in the modern world. And once we get a bit of connection back, a lot of the downstream consequences just go away. Uh, I'll have to report back. This could be a whole new podcast series. Please do. How's Will getting on? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we've, talk, we've spoken a lot about the, the sort of things that you can do, the action that you can do to improve your life. And as we were mentioning earlier, sometimes the pressure to do action can be overwhelming at the beginning of a new year because we try and take on too much. Um, through books like Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, we've also learned the importance of things like sleep, getting a proper night's sleep to help, help not just our mental health, our physical health as well. What about rest, though? So in an increasingly hectic world, which we've also spoken about, taking time in our conscious hours to find rest is just as important according to a new book, is just as important according to a new book from Claudia Hammond called The Art of Rest. I spoke to her about what rest actually means and what things we can do to best aid our health. Bibliophiles will be very happy with what came out on top of the list. Rest is something we need to value much more than we do. So people have started to take sleep much more seriously. But I think we need to take rest more seriously. And when I say rest, I mean when you're awake. So not having a nap, that doesn't count. Things that you do that feel restful while you're awake. Rest seems to have a huge impact on well-being. And with a group of psychologists from Durham University, we conducted what became the world's largest survey on rest. And 18,000 people from 135 different countries filled in this very long survey, explaining everything about why they wanted to rest, whether they wanted more rest and the ways that they did it. And we analysed all that data. And we found that two thirds of people said that they wanted more rest than they got now. And when we looked at the well-being scores of people, those who got enough rest, the lucky third who didn't want more rest, had well-being scores twice as high as those people who felt in need of more rest. And I think these days, many people just feel that overwhelmed with the number of things they have to do. You know, we've all got these to-do lists that are just far too long. And people also put some of those demands on themselves as well. And so people want to, you know, be brilliant cooks and... Uh, you know be really fit and go and see lots of different things and do loads of things and do really well at work and make sure that they see their friends all the time people want to do all of these different things and put some of these demands on their set themselves and then lots of other external demands come on us as well and so people do feel very very busy these days and now it's interesting when you look at time use surveys that they suggest that we haven't got less free time in fact than people had say in the 1950s that people are just as busy but it doesn't feel like that and I think partly that's because we we feel on call all the time you know our phones can interrupt us all the time mm. there's there's emails there's there's the, there's a, a blurring of the boundaries between work and leisure and that makes us feel more under pressure so what we need to do is to try to carve out some time to rest and to find for each of us individually almost our own personal prescription for rest to work out what are the activities that are really going to make me feel more rested um, and so it's really important to take some time in the day to try to do that and it doesn't have to mean sitting around doing nothing or, or you know lying on a sofa and in fact many people find doing nothing difficult I mean we have we have a top 10 of the activities that people found the most restful doing nothing uh came in at number five so it wasn't the top activity um, and many people find uh, doing nothing so difficult that there was one study done in the states where people were asked to um, sit in a room for 15 minutes a bare room they couldn't have their phone and they weren't allowed to nap and there was no book and nothing for them to do they were just had their own thoughts for 15 minutes mm. but one thing they did have available to them 
was um, a sort of ankle bracelet that could give them an electric shock if they chose to press the button on the computer. <laughs> now, they didn't have to do it, but they could choose whether to if they wanted to. And what was amazing was that um, almost three quarters of the men decided to give themselves at least one electric shock. Rather than do nothing at all. Rather than do nothing at all. That's how hard it is to be do do nothing and be alone with your thoughts for some people. Twenty five percent of women decided to give themselves an electric shock. I don't know what that tells us about men and women. Three times as many women three times as many men thought this was a good thing to do. One man shocked himself a hundred and ninety one times. Um, you know, obviously enjoyed it. But, um, uh, you know, masochists apart, I think it does tell us something about how difficult we find it to do nothing. Mm. So when I'm talking about rest, I'm not saying you have to do nothing. And in fact, 38% of people told us that they found going for a a walk really restful. Um, 8% found running restful and said that they needed to tire out their bodies in order to switch their minds off, that their minds were still racing with things unless they had something really absorbing. And number one was reading which was interesting because we were quite surprised because reading takes some effort um, and we know that within the brain you know the brain has to do all sorts of things in order to read it's got to um, you know look at those words make sense of those words make the sense of those words in relation to the words that have gone before them and uh, in terms of your other thoughts and your memories and experiences and reading really seems to take people out of themselves so it's it's a way of escaping but it's also a way of um, allowing you to reflect on your own life as well so some people might might read and think about what they would do in those situations you start to empathize and you, and you put yourself in the situation say if it's fiction of, of characters mm. but non-fiction um, has been found to be uh, just as relaxing for people to read, so it doesn't it doesn't have to be fiction if if people prefer non-fiction, and people also don't have to be concentrating all the time, so it is okay. I shouldn't say this as someone who writes books. It is okay to let your mind wander while you read. Yeah. And there've been really interesting experiments uh, tracking people's eye movements, and you can tell that people um, that their mind is wandering, even though their eyes carry on going along the lines and down the page, that they're not taking it in and not thinking about it because usually, because one people's rate of blinking changes if they're not um, concentrating, and the other is that um, usually people's eye movements slow down over um, long, difficult words and people, or unfamiliar words, and people have to think about those a bit. And you can detect that if you track people's eye movements. And they stay at this steady rate when people are not concentrating. And it's it's known as mindless reading within the psychological literature. Mm. But that's fine too. So in a way, a book is a really good jumping off point for daydreaming. And daydreaming was another one in the top ten because it's another thing that allows us to get away from our worries for a while. So daydreaming is problematic if people are ruminating about negative things constantly. But daydreaming, where you stare out of the window and just think about other things than what you're supposed to be thinking about, Mm. seems to be a very restful experience and and, and a good thing for people. Uh, We know that people don't tend to find other people that restful. So the top five activities were all things people tend to do on their own. And in fact, socialising with um, friends and, and, you know, chatting with family uh, came, uh, wasn't it? Things like socialising with friends and chatting with family didn't come in the top ten, Mm. which was quite interesting, even when we separated it and just looked at the um, extroverts. Even the extroverts for restfulness they may enjoy it but for restfulness want to to get away from people but reading is perfect for that because you have the company of those characters so you needn't feel alone if you don't want to feel alone but they don't demand anything from you (laughs) they so that they you can you know pay attention to them when you want to and then you can close the book when you want to and then you can come back to them when you want to and they you don't owe them anything they don't expect anything from you and so i think that's why reading can be so restful I think it was Hemingway who said, there is no friend as loyal as a book. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. They'll never leave you. Taking our cue from that final thought, it is time to hear now from our booksellers as they give us their book recommendations based on this theme of changes. Hi, my name's Nick from Waterstones Piccadilly. The book I recommend on the theme of changes is All Among the Barley by Melissa Harrison. It's about a young woman in a village in Suffolk in the 1930s, dissatisfied with her lot, and change comes to her and her village in an unusual and unexpected form. Hi, this is Katrina from Glasgow, and my recommendation on the subject of changes is Queenie by Candace Carty Williams. It's the story of a young woman who's stuck on self-destruct and her finding her way back to caring about herself and her life. It's really funny, poignant and absolutely filthy. I loved it. 
So there we go. We've had bookseller recommendations based on changes. We've had different ideas about what change actually means. Rangan, I can't thank you enough uh, for your insight into how we can make huge changes in our lives with actually small actions every day. Guys, well, look, thank you very much for inviting me on. Uh, and genuinely, I am a huge fan of uh, places like Waterstones. Uh, my family and I were often in our local Waterstones most weekends. I think it's a great thing for my kids to do, look at books in real life, in person, <laughs> if touch them, you know, these sort of things. And they're all really in keeping with what I believe in. So thanks very much for having me on. An absolute pleasure. Thank you. Holly, what do you think you're going to be doing for your health in, in the new year? Uh, the five minutes of rest, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Something we can all sign up to. In our next episode, we're going to be exploring the theme of adaptation, speaking to three authors who have all seen their books turned into other things. So join us as we hear from RJ Palacio, Neil Gaiman and Margaret Atwood. We'll see you then. <laughs>